We are down hard on the year. We are up nicely on a session from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Here's the price action. Your equity market up eight tenths of one percent on the S and P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. From New York, we begin with the big issue. The Fed chair isn't for turning. That was a very artful statement. Clearly articulating uh, the room to tighten. The MO that the Fed has been using. The use of the word nimble and humble. A dovish pivot to, to tightening. They're trying not to shock the market. He said at least three or four times this cycle of tightening will look very different. They made it clear they're not going to shrink the balance sheet till after they start raising rates. He just kept hammering. Uh, you know, and then and we got the reaction in, in, in the markets. Actually, we should take some reassurance for that. The problem is they still have to deal with inflation. The recipe Jerome Powell is going to be using is going to change. The Fed is, is quite confident about the economic outlook. We sit here with about five rate hikes priced in. How clear uh, Chair Powell was in terms of his expectations for the room for tightening. They do think that the economy can digest all of these rate hikes. Joining us now to discuss Morgan Stanley's Lisa Shallot, Crossmarks, Bob Dole and Julian Emanuel of Evercor. Let's start with you, Lisa. They talked a lot. They haven't done a lot yet. What's your takeaway? Well, look, I, I think markets, um, you know, definitely interpreted uh, Powell rightfully as as hawkish. But I think the market is also recognizing that we're, you know, walking a tightrope here. Uh, where, you know, one of the questions is, you know, is the Fed in a position of, you know, uh, too much too late, meaning, you know, they're suddenly uh, going to start tightening in earnest uh, right into what may already be an organic slowing and, and peaking in, in inflation? Uh, or alternatively, uh, are they going to fail and are they going to remain behind the curve? And it, is inflation going to prove persistent and inflation expectations going to continue uh, to, to drift higher? So I, I think we're in a really tenuous situation here. Uh, and I, I think the Fed's got a really tough job to do. This bond market's making a move off the back of it all. Yields higher on the front end by two basis points now to 117. Very briefly breaking 120. Economist after economist in the last 24 hours, baking more rate hikes in for this year. Julian Emanuel, this from Matt Lazzelli and Deutsche Bank. We now anticipated that we will get five hikes in total this year at each meeting from March through June and then return to a quarterly hiking profile before year end as they see clearer evidence of falling inflation. Julian, where's the consensus and where are you? I think the consensus has moved to five hikes in 2022 and QT starting somewhere in, you know, at mid-year, give or take. And frankly, when you think about it, uh, what's interesting is, is, is Chair Powell made a very pointed uh, uh, remark in thinking, in getting the market to think that this is more than 2018. And when you think about it from a market's perspective, how many times they raised rates, how much balance sheet there, roll off there was in 2018. It is in some ways a wonder that we're as stable as we are this morning, given the fact that 2018 saw Valmageddon in the first quarter of that year, and then a 20% down in the fourth quarter of that year. It is, as Lisa said, a really difficult uh, tightrope to walk. Let's be clear, that was not a great year at all. As Julian says, the back end of that year for credit was just abysmal. What we heard repeatedly yesterday was 2015, when we started that rate hiking cycle, the economy this time is stronger. Inflation is higher. We can go sooner. We can go quicker. Morgan Stanley wrote this. Forward guidance is gone, as is the comfortably well-telegraphed signal about the Fed policy path that comes with it. As Powell stressed in almost every answer, this expansion is different from the last, and the policy approach will be different to reflect that. Bob Dole, when they say different, people hear quicker, faster, sooner. Do you hear the same thing? Sure do, especially given where we're starting. Zero. Fed funds are zero. That was put in place when we had an emergency, and the emergency has long since passed, and the Fed did nothing about it, and then they sat on their hands arguing inflation was transitory when to many of us it was clear 
no, it wasn't transitory. And so they, they're, as bo both other panelists have said, uh, they're between a rock and a hard place. They have a lot of catch up to do and have to figure out how to do it without upsetting the apple cart. Can they upset the labor market? That was a question that came up in a news conference yesterday. I thought this comment from Chairman Powell, lots of other people picked up on it too, was so important about the path for policy. Take a listen to this. I think there's quite a bit of room to raise interest rates without threatening the labor market. This is, by so many measures, a historically tight labor market. Let's get to Mike McKee. Mike McKee, there's some signal there, isn't there? Definitely. The chairman came out and he told everybody what the Fed's going to do, uh, hearkening back to that old football coach, I think it was Ted Lasso, who said, uh, number one, do your job, and their job is fighting inflation. A hawk's nest from Jay Powell. He said they're going to start raising rates. The March 5th, 16th meeting is uh, when they would do that. Didn't rule out a 50 basis point increase at some point, and that scared the markets. They could raise it every meeting, which means more work for us, John, and a quicker balance sheet reduction. And we're going to have to figure out exactly how they do that and what that means. But as Powell says, this time is different. You look at the GDP numbers we got this morning, 6.9 percent. That's the strongest in many, many years. And it does suggest the economy is in better shape for the Fed to be able to do this than certainly the last time they started this uh, shall we say, tightening process. Uh, the thing that we're going to be watching, of course, is financial conditions. You can see uh, off of just a little bit today, but they, they rose a significant amount yesterday after the Fed announcement and the Powell News Conference. How close do they get to a really tight market? That remains to be seen. And then, of course, uh, as you were just talking about with the panel, Fed futures pricing, we're looking now at uh, five rate hikes priced in for this year, a significant jump from yesterday. And the question is, do we get even more than that as we get the data we get tomorrow, the ECI that turned the Fed around towards a hawkish move? And we also also get the December PCE uh, price index, and then on uh, February 10th, we get the CPI. So those are going to be big days for the markets. Mike McKee, thank you. Really important moment for this Federal Reserve, as Lisa Shannon has said repeatedly already this morning. For me, just going back over that news conference yesterday evening, just to rewatch for a second time, that line on the labor market jumped out to me again and reminded me of 2018. So let me read you these two quotes. This from yesterday. There's quite a bit of room to raise interest rates without threatening the labor market. This line from Chairman Powell back in 2018. We may go past neutral, but we're a long way from neutral at this point, probably. Lisa, this is not a science. Part of this is a guessing game. He talked about the balance sheet running off in the background almost passively. We won't think about it. That's not how this stuff plays out in practice, as you know. Lisa, and they don't really know what kind of impact that balance sheet runoff would have on this market, especially the numbers that I've heard that they might run ahead with. What does this all mean for you, Lisa? How much of a guessing game is this? I, look, I, I think for uh, investors, this is a really tough uh, environment. And, and, you know, what we keep emphasizing to clients is we're talking about a Fed uh, that not only is admitted that they've got the cost of capital in this economy potentially wrong vis-a-vis -vis inflation, and thus will be raising rates at, at potentially uh, an accelerated pace, uh, but the discussion of the balance sheet is about the supply of liquidity. So it's not just the cost of capital, it's the amount of capital. And so you're trying to play two levers at once. And this has not been a market uh, where we've had a lot of good price discovery about where neutral really is. And this has been one of the big debates uh, is what is the terminal rate? What is neutral? Uh, and, you know, I think we're a little bit going to be searching in the dark. And so I say all this to say that for investors, uh, that just has to mean bigger risk premiums, bigger risk premiums in the bond market uh, and bigger risk premiums in the stock market, uh, which means you've got to get higher yields, which means lower prices in both stocks and bonds. I hate to say that, uh, but but I, I don't think that, that this repricing is over quite yet. And that's as close as Lisa Shannon will come to saying, go to cash. Because right now, <laughs> Julian Emanuel, things are that tough. Julian, I've talked with you before about the Fed put. My colleague, Eric Shaska, caught up with Greg Jensen at Bridgewater, wrote up a really lovely story on the Bloomberg this morning. Here's the quote from it. 
Some decline in asset prices is not a bad thing from the Fed's perspective, so they're going to let it happen. At these levels, it would take a much bigger move to get the Fed put into the money. They're a long way from it. They think we need to see a 15 to 20 percent move over at Bridgewater. Julian, you've done some work on this, too. You don't think we're anywhere near either. No, we're not. And, and it, it's actually good in a way that over the last week or so that the market is disabusing itself of the notion that the Fed put lies somewhere between down 10 and down 15. If you look back, there are two things. Number one, that put is exercised very infrequently. March of 2020. And then interestingly enough, when uh, the chair made his famous Powell pivot in January of 2019. And when you look at uh, going back to the first Fed put in 1987, the average is down around 23.8 percent, which gets us into uh, the mid thir uh, 3600s. Uh, and so we do have a long way to go. And part of that debate around what the neutral rate is likely to create that extra level of uncertainty that there is a floor but much lower. Bob, we've got a rally this morning at least. We're up more than 1% on the Nasdaq, on the S&P up 8 tenths. As you know, year to date, the Nasdaq hammered down by 13% into Thursday. Bob, what's your message for people looking to pick up some of the pieces here, both at the index level and beneath the surface, where in some places, let's be clear, let's be fair, there's been some carnage beneath the index level. What's your message for them this morning, Bob? Uh, be careful, be wary. If you have money to put into the stock market, only do it on weakness. And if you need to take money out, a green day is a good day to do it. Um, our view coming into the year is cash is king. Stocks uh, will uh, be down on the year. I hope it's not by a lot because if we're in a tug of war here. Um, the headwinds of valuations for all the reasons we've been talking so far. But I hope there's some tailwind from OK earnings. And that will prevent the stock market from having a very nasty drop, in my view. And uh, with interest rates up, that means bonds are down. So uh, cash, despite its very low return, is king. Sounded pretty bearish around this panel. One of these guests does have a 5,100 year-end price target on the S&P. You guess, and then I'll reveal it a little bit further down the line. Julian Emanuel, Bob Dole, <laughs> Lisa Shallot. Your equity market's doing OK this morning. This morning, on this session, it's doing OK. On the year, not so much. With some movers, here's Abby. Well, John, similar to that mixed picture you were just talking about between the year and the session, we have a mixed picture for the home builders. And not surprisingly, some of the home builders are down on that super hawkish message from the Fed and yields backing up so uh, much yesterday, that two-year yield up again today. However, we do have one stock that's higher, and DR Horton had been higher. Uh, KB Home is up 1.9% uh, on an upgrade over at B of A to a buy. On the other hand, you have Lennar and Toll down not just on the rate picture, but a piece of that, B of A also cutting those to an underperform on valuation concerns. Abby, thank you. We'll catch up with you around the open and bow with equity futures up nine tenths on the S&P. Coming up, President Biden rounding up corporate endorsements in an effort to revive his economic agenda. They're America's top business leaders and being here to support the Build Back Better initiative is, uh, I think, important. But we face some real challenges. We've got to get uh, uh, get prices in check. That's next. This is Bloomberg. A lot of folks refer to this as just social spending. Well, I see it, uh, but I see it this way. The Build Back Better plan lowers prices for families and gets people working. It creates the best educated workforce, in, hopefully, in the world and ensures it remain the most dynamic and productive economy in the world. President Biden looking to corporate America to revive his stalling economic agenda. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo highlighting the challenges that still remain. I don't know that it will get worse before it gets better. But uh, there's, there's no reason to believe it's going to get meaningfully better anytime soon. What has to happen is we need to make more chips. Unfortunately, there's no easy solution. The solution is increased domestic manufacturing of chips, which is what we need to do. Down in D.C., let's get to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie. Hey, Anne-Marie. 
Hey, John. Well, for the Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, she may get her chip soon. When you look at the China competitive bill and $52 billion in grants going to the semiconductor unit. But when it comes to the president, Jonathan, flanked by those executives, for me, it was less what he said. We heard all those talking points already about inflation, how he thinks it's going to help the everyday American consumer and worker. But now, after the administration was really under a lot of criticism that the president in his first year of office was maybe pacifying the progressives way too much, he looked to corporate America. He was sitting alongside executives from Microsoft, GM, and Ford. And with their presence there, pretty much giving a blessing on his Build Back Better agenda. And going into that meeting, the Ford CEO said he really hopes the president does not get rid of those tax credits for electric vehicles. And he pointed to the competition the U.S. is under. When you look at EV sales, it's some 2 percent in America, where it's north of 20 percent in Europe and going to be very much uh, higher and competitive in China. But Jonathan, as you and I spoke about last week, this is going to be a different package, and Bank of America already said it's going to be billed back smaller. They are expecting about half of the president's fiscal agenda to actually get through. AMH, just quickly, every time I look at the commodity market, I think of this White House. I see WTI 88 and Brent at 90. Through 91, briefly, we know there are limits as to what they can do about this, but AMH is going to have some impact on what they try and do later this year in the midterms. Your thoughts on what their next move is? They were very sensitive to this at the back end of last year. Prices are higher now than they were then. Well, they're sensitive to it yesterday. Jonathan, as I was looking at my Bloomberg terminal yesterday with Brent approaching 90, there was a tweet from the economic advisor, Brian Deese, talking about them and the work they did with tapping the SPR, which moved the needle very so slightly in terms of what they can actually do. This administration is going to have to potentially make some phone calls, and it's going to be the OPEC Plus producers. But OPEC Plus is struggling at the moment for many of them to even reach their own quotas. Russia is struggling to reach their own quotas. Put aside the fact that potentially is not the greatest time to ask Vladimir Putin to help out the United States when it comes to gas prices. So they're going to have to go to their key ally in the Middle East, and that's going to be Riyadh. And this is where the geopolitics can also play into some of that. Yeah. President Biden has really not wanted to pick up the phone to Mohammed bin Salman. He wanted to deal directly with the king. And that is something I think Riyadh will be looking for if they're going to make any sort of amendments when it comes to oil production. You and I will talk about the geopolitics in about 20 minutes or so. So stay close, Amory. Thank you. I want to get straight back to the panel. Lisa Shallot, crude at 90 on Brent, WTI 88. Energy equities on the S&P up almost 18 percentage points year to date. It's just been a monster move. Lisa, where are you on energy equities at the moment? We're continuing to be buyers. And, and look, you know, the, the issue for us is, is really a function of the fact that, you know, for the last five or six years, back to the, the, the last time we saw a crash in energy prices in 2016, we've had a structural underinvestment in, in the global carbon footprint, right? Um, and, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. And, and ultimately, that may be the right directional trend. But at the minute, uh, you know, we don't have sufficient alternative energy uh, sources to, to, to catch up. Uh, with the with the rate at which you know demand is growing, and our view is that international economies uh, in 2022 are actually going to see their growth improve, uh, and so you know our our call is is for these these prices to stay up there. Actually, my colleague at Morgan Stanley is calling for a hundred dollars uh, average price in uh, for WTI for the year. Uh, and that's going to wow. be a factor in this whole inflation equation here. But we do like energy equities, to answer your question. Well, I think we all like them if we get crewed up to 100 and we average that through the back end of this year. Bob Dahl, on energy equities, your thoughts? Uh, you know, we put 10 predictions out every year, and the one dealing with uh, sectors was financials and energy. It's one of our favorite groups. For some of the reasons Lisa just said, I think the one people are missing is, Lisa pointed it out, stronger economies overseas. They're big users of uh, oil and gas. And of course, oil is a global commodity. Uh, it's a supply and demand story with the world getting uh, be better growth. That means more demand and supply is more mixed, including for some political reasons. So the price of least resistance has been up and that's good for the stocks. Julian, drum roll. You're the man with the 5,100 price target year end on the S&P 500. Something needs to work to get you there. Which part of this market does the heavy lifting? So, John, we are unabashed fans of value here. 
above trend economic growth, higher inflation, higher interest rates, all a combination for value stocks, financials, industrials, uh, energies. You know, we've long liked it. Our only concern there would be is uh, once you get towards $100, that could be one of these times where the cure for high prices is high prices. So we prefer to get more constructive on, on sort of a, a pullback, uh, but very respectful of the fact that this entire turn towards value, which we think against the strong earnings backdrop, does in fact get us higher at the index level, uh, is something that investors are getting around. And clearly energy has been uh, one of the ground centrals for that. Gillian, we've got more time together. Just give me the teaser here. Why do I want to bet on both interest rates and on inflation when the former is set to do something about the latter? Very simple. We're at 180 on the 10 year yield. We're, you know, just north of uh, 1% uh, on, on the shorter yields. This is really, if you think about it, uh, the end of a 40-year downtrend in interest rates. We're not saying that the full-on bear market has begun, but clearly uh, you've gone sideways the last three years. Uh, and frankly, when you think about it, the last time we had inflation at this level, the 10-year yield was 14%. There's <laughs> lots of room on the ups. Julian. Stay close, sit tight, alongside Bob Dell and Lisa Shallop. Coming up on this program, the morning calls and later, the equity fallout from a hawkish chair power. That conversation is just ahead. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell. Equities with a nice lift here, up nine tenths of one percent on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up by around about one percent, one point two percent higher. That's the equity story. Here's the bond market picture. Look at twos, briefly through one point two percent. Yields higher by a couple of basis points, just south of that level now. That's the bond market picture. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Goldman upgrading Corning to a buy, seeing a solid backdrop with supply dynamics improving and headwinds receding. That stock is positive, one point five five percent. Next up, Bank of America downgrading Toll Brothers to underperform. The analyst expecting a rocky year following a long period of lower rates and higher demand. We're down there by 1.26%. And finally, Tesla remaining a top pick at Piper Sandler. The analyst saying there's still plenty of reasons to remain bullish following the automaker's quarterly results. That stock is up by about a third of 1%. Coming up, looking ahead to another big earnings report. Apple moving into the spotlight with results coming after the close. Your opening bell's up next with equity futures up nine tenths of 1%. Down on the year, up on the session from New York City this morning. Good morning. The Thursday morning price action shapes up as follows. At 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up by a little more than 1%, up by 1.22. The Russell, the small caps, up 9 tenths of 1%. That's the opening bell. This, believe it or not, a bit of a snooze. Get to the bond market. That's where the action is. We come down four basis points on tens. We're up by a similar amount on twos through much of this morning. On twos, we breached 120 briefly. This curve is flatter, and this dollar is so much stronger. Euro dollar with a break of 112 to 111.52, down by eight tenths of 1%. If you take the dollar index, heavily weighted towards the single currency, the euro, yes, I know. But still, that's the broader story. Dollar strength, bleeding through G10, bleeding through EM. The dollar index, the highest since July 2020. And even with that dollar strength, even with the prospect of higher interest rates from the Federal Reserve, we're looking at a crude market that's still rallying. $88 a barrel, up one full percentage point. You've got to go back to October 2014. For the last time we saw crude this high, Brent's through 90. That was a month before the Saudis started that market share war. Crude right now, 88.20. Let's get you a thought of PIMCO's Jerome Schneider and what he had to say on Chairman Powell in that news conference yesterday. Clearly it panicked. The market was looking for a lot of comfort food yesterday and it got a helping of nothing. And from that perspective, it became a little bit over angst with the fact that potential for rates is actually going much higher than the market had suggested. This playbook is actually aged old, old age in terms of the sense that we continually see the market in rate hiking cycles overshoot the actual reality of where that rate hiking sequence comes. So from a practitioner's point of view, 
This is actually an opportunity to look at where rates are. What is comfort food? And we've got a helping of nothing. Julian Emmanuel, Bob Dole, Lisa Shallot. I want to come to you, Julian, because Ed Hyman and you and the team over at Evercore actually still have a pretty punchy outlook for GDP. And Julian, just walk me through how that stacks up with what you expect from this market, at least in the near term, through the first couple of quarters. Sure. Well, if you look at the first quarter, Ed took his number down to 2%, but still sees scope for 4.5% on the full year. And I think a lot of that is driven. And I think this is, this is where, you know, some of our optimism on the equity market is placed as well, is that if you assume that the virus becomes endemic at mid-year, uh, the potential for perhaps even <clears throat> above those numbers, uh, because you're bringing the rest of the world back online, as it were, uh, exists. And furthermore, if, if we're right about the course of the virus, that actually sets up the potential for above uh, trend growth, above uh, consensus estimates into 2023 as well. And, and again, to us, that's a recipe uh, for not only strong earnings growth, but also the potential if you unclog the supply chain issues uh, for a little bit of, of inflation abatement within the bigger picture of, of higher inflation. That's baked into the guidance of some of the corporations as well. In fact, we've seen it from the airlines repeatedly over the last few weeks. Southwest this morning, no different. Losses in January, losses in February, profits in March. And they hope the runway's clear from there through the rest of this year. Lisa Shallot, you and the team at Morgan Stanley, though, I think of the work of Mike Wilson over the weekend into this week, a little bit more concerned about not the inflation story or the policy response to it, but the slowdown out the other side, the weakness in growth at the back end of this year, Lisa, how profound, how pronounced do you think that will be? Well, look, I, I think we are going to have to deal with it, um, you know, sooner than, the, than uh, the, the very end of the year. I mean, look, we just got these great uh, Q4 GDP numbers. And while, you know, Chair Powell yesterday, you know, suggested his intent to look through uh, the first quarter uh, GDP numbers, which might be tainted by, you know, Omicron. The reality is, is that, uh, you know, in all likelihood, we're going to see a sequential deceleration that's pretty profound from, you know, the the 6.9 percent that was just reported to something as as Julian said, you know, closer to to two percent or less uh, in Q1, and that means that your your PMI numbers, your order to inventory numbers, uh, all kinds of demand drivers are going to look very weak. And we know that the correlations between, you know, PMI ratios and and uh, you know change in S and P 500 is pretty good. So we think that that you know some of this slowing debate may happen sooner rather than later. Uh, and, and we need to get past that and get that into the numbers uh, before, you know, I think Mike Wilson and I um, and, and the rest of the team would get more bullish. Bob Dole, are you waiting for the same thing? So I, I'm going to uh, agree with both sides. That is to say, slow down in the first quarter, probably more than people think. We're using three and a half for the full year. We do think, back to Julian's points, we'll see some pickup uh, in the back part of the year. There's still a lot of underlying strength. I'm encouraged by the big surprise on inventory build in the fourth quarter of last year and the number reported this morning. I hope that means we're starting to solve some of the supply shortage uh, uh, problems. Uh, t time will tell. That's a big element along with COVID, but there's a lot of momentum still in the system. Five minutes into this, we are positive on the S&P by one full percentage point. Top of the pile, energy by 1.9%. Bottom of the pile, underperforming, relatively speaking, but still positive, consumer discretionary, up by about a third of 1%. Every industry group on my screen right now in positive territory. On some of the price action, let's get to Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, as you were mentioning earlier, probably one of the biggest beneficiar beneficiaries from a hawkish Fed, that dollar, the Bloomberg dollar index now up for a fourth day in a row, the most going back to September. And as you mentioned, uh, the DXY, that dollar index, the highest since July of 2020. And the fact that you had the dollar higher into yesterday's meeting suggests that perhaps the dollar was anticipating the massive move up yesterday, that back up in yields that we saw, that two-year yield yesterday up an extraordinary 13 basis points. In fact, if we put the dollar uh, next to the two-year yield, we'll see both are going in the same direction. But more recently, the dollar 
dollar as it climbs back toward the top of a trend channel, absolutely being helped out by that backup in two year yields, supporting the dollar. Not surprisingly, as cheap money comes out of the system and the cost of capital is potentially uh, going to go up th this year, that is not helping growth down about 13 percent. Value underperforming, excuse me, outperforming, still down in the year, uh, but down a lot less than growth. Today, John, it's a pretty even race, though. Both are higher, as you might expect with these bullish markets, but it is actually growth in the lead just a bit at this point, John. Abby, thank you. Let's turn to Tesla. That stock is down by more than 3 percent, raising concerns over persistent supply chain constraints. Dan Ives over at Wedbush said this, with the chip shortage still a major overhang, these delivery numbers combined with this impressive earnings speech speaks to an EV demand trajectory that looks quite robust for Tesla with clear momentum heading through 22. On the West Coast, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joins us now with more. Hey, Ed. Good morning, John. On Dan Ives' point, right, it's a case of money left on the table. They said that for several quarters, production output at Shanghai and Fremont had been depressed because of su supply chain crunches, right? Imp impressive beat on the top and bottom line. But we know in this earnings season, that's not enough. What we want is outlook. And they said, yes, we'll grow an annualized rate of 50 percent this year, just like they said last year, but no specific numbers on how that growth comes from Berlin and Austin, for example. Then we think about future and supply chain. Come with me into the Bloomberg terminal and let's look at margins. Think about margins for a second. Zach Kirk on the CFO says, Inflation is a headwind. Rising commodity prices are a headwind. You bring two new factories online when your best factories that are already online have depressed volumes. That mix of profitable and less profitable vehicles changes. And then what happens to margins? MODL Go on the terminal will show you decelerating margin growth throughout this year. But don't worry, John, because in the long term, Elon Musk says this is all about full self-driving. In fact, John, this year is the year that full self-driving becomes real. And in the long term, they really put a lot of uh, credence, I guess, on software being the big driver of profitability. I want to ask you this question, John. Where do we go on the stock? The price target, average target price target is uh, 9.50. We're at around 9.30 now. There's not much room to go. This is a stock that trades at 85 times forward earnings. We know where we stand now with the Fed and the outlook for rates. Is this an attractive stock when, when we think about valuations? And then we think about Apple, right? Apple's up 15% since an October 4 low. How high is the bar for earnings today? We know supply chain is going to be the focus after Tesla and because Apple's reporting from a key holiday season. How hard is that buy and how strong does the outlook, outlook have to be from the lessons we've learned from Tesla? Ed, thank you, buddy. I'm going to pick up on that question and go straight to Julian Emanuel. And Julian, I won't be flippant about this and I don't mean to be snarky. I just wonder whether these earnings actually matter. Given the backdrop right now, given the focus on rates, the Federal Reserve and ultimately just a broad derating of this market through much of this year. Julian, what say you? No, they do matter. But, but what's different about th this earnings season is, is that the commentary around margins in particular and supply chain disruptions is very, very much the focus. So if, if you're going to say that you expect these things to resolve themselves or, in fact, if you have companies that have said that we understand we are in a position to navigate and benefit in terms of margins from this higher inflation uh, environment and we've got the supply chain under control, those stocks still do OK. But the, the punishment for those that have margin issues or talk about supply chain issues is disproportionate in a higher volatility environment. I just got this table from Alan Ruskin over at Deutsche Bank and it has two columns through it. And I wish I could share it with you all, but it just dropped into my inbox. And on the one side, it has what the equity bears are saying. And on the other side, it says what the equity bulls are saying about the same situation. He's called it a titanic battle. At the top, it says, don't fight the Fed as they take away the punch bowl, the bears. The bulls say the punch bowl has plenty of punch left. Real rates are low, money supply strong. QE taper tantrum is here, plus QT fears are warranted. The equity bears, the equity bulls, accelerated rate hiking expectations are already priced in. And you mentioned margins, so let's talk about margins. The bears would say the firms are facing raw material and labor cost pressures. Margins peaked in Q1 21. The bulls would say firms have pricing power, strong margin will hold in. Bob Dole, on that last point on margins, which side are you on? I'm on the nervous side. Uh, I, I am amazed how strong margins stayed as cost pressures uh, came into the picture. We saw in the third quarter earnings releases how companies were uh, able to pass most of those on. I think that uh, that gigs run out of time. What about you, Lisa? 
Uh, yeah, we're we're with Bob on this. Uh, you know, our our sense is that we are going to start seeing you know companies have to guide and and one of the guide down on margins and and talk about the cost pressures that they're seeing. And I think the biggest piece of that's going to be labor. Um, you know, no matter who you are, whether you know you're you're a mega cap tech company or you know you're you're uh, you know a smaller mid cap company. Uh, in a distribution channel, the the issues around wage inflation, uh, I think, are real. Uh, we're seeing it in every industry, uh, and I think that that's going to be one of the talking points as as corporate managements have to have to uh, you know uh, revise guidance. Bob Dole, uh, and, and I, I want to build on, on what Lisa's talking about. And Lisa, I apologise for jumping in right at the end there, but as I listen to Lisa and as I listen to Bob. Lisa, I'm really familiar with your thoughts and the research you've done together with the team at Morgan Stanley. Bob, we don't catch up quite as often, and I wish we could. I can't think of the last time I heard you this bearish, Bob. When was the last time you were this bearish on this market? Oh, it goes back some time. We came into the year with a target of 4,500. The consensus said the market's going to go up with earnings. Not everybody, but that was the vast majority. And our view is earnings will be OK, and maybe they're going to be a little less than OK now. Um, the problem is derating. When, when you have inflation at seven, consumer price index trailing, rather than two, and you have the Fed at the very beginning of a rate rise cycle, you can't expect PEs to stay at 22, which is where they were. So uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a very volatile year on, in both directions. I don't think it's straight down. Uh, 4,500 is our target for your M, which is uh, you know, down for the year, but up a little bit from where we are. Julian, what are they getting wrong in your mind? Well, uh, I, I'll go back to uh, Chair Powell yesterday, and I would just say this, is that if there's any let up whatsoever in the margin issues, in the labor issues, and Chair Powell's fondest wish when he went to sleep last night was that the participation rate would rise, and I think you can make an argument that at some point this year, again, going back to the virus, that it will rise, um, that to us sort of signals the potential for this continued growth with, albeit somewhat, uh, you know, still elevated, but uh, 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 dis diminished uh, inflation concerns. And we think ultimately earnings will power the market higher. Lisa Shallot, I've got 20 seconds left. It's all yours. Final word. Uh, I, I would just say, you know, we're at a, in a place where it's, you know, quote unquote, be careful out there. Um, you know, I'll, I'll end where I started, which is the Fed is walking a really thin tightrope here, uh, and there's not a lot of margin for error. Lisa Shallot, Bob Dole, Julian Emanuel, fantastic panel, guys. Thank you so much. Coming up on this program, the West united on Ukraine, with the U.S. and U.K. coming together over sanctions should Russia invade. We are working on a wide-ranging, uh, deep package of sanctions going further than was done in 2014 over Crimea. And everybody is on the same page in the sense that President Putin risks very severe sanctions if he goes into Ukraine. That is next. This is Bloomberg. to dialogue. We prefer diplomacy. It remains up to Russia to decide how to respond. We're ready either way. The United States continuing to urge Americans to leave Ukraine amid Russia tensions with the embassy in Kiev writing in a statement the following. The security situation in Ukraine continues to be unpredictable due to the increased threat of Russian military action and can deteriorate with little notice. Joining us now from Brussels, here's Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, and Anne Maria is down in DC. Maria, good morning and good afternoon to you. What's the latest? Well, you know, here's the thing. You talk about that risk of any uh, war or military conflict breaking out at any moment. That is something the United States has said for weeks now. But I do want to say they are talking again, and that's been uh, good enough for the ruble this morning. If you see it, uh, it's ticked up a little. Now, just to give you some context here, Jonathan, the United States and NATO has now, or they have together jointly sent to NATO letters that would explain, that would address some of the security concerns that Russia may have. Remember, they said that they were open uh, 
uh, to pulling back some of the military equipment that could be problematic for Russia if they also pulled back some of the troops from eastern Ukraine. Now, the Russians have said that uh, President Vladimir Putin has now read the documents that he will take time in fully responding, but they continue to say for the time being, a war with Ukraine is something that's, quote, unthinkable for Russia. Whether or not you believe that that is uh, the next move for the Russians, it is giving the ruble a prop this morning, this idea that the situation continues to be tense, but nonetheless, they continue to engage diplomatically. Amory, how viable is the off-ramp? Well, that's the big question, right? Will President Vladimir Putin take this off-ramp? They're not saying completely yet no to the proposals. What they're saying is it doesn't meet their primary security demands. Potentially, there is going to be some discussions on the secondary security demands, whether it's military exercises where placement of missiles are. This could potentially be a, a moment for President Vladimir Putin to sell to the Russian people that he was able to get something out of the West, given the aggression he has right now in terms of 100,000 troops on the Ukraine border and these military exercises planned in Belarus. AMH, just looking at the administration right now, selling the GDP figures. Just to move on quickly to that, that statement from the White House, I'll read out the first paragraph. The GDP numbers for my first year show that we are finally building an American economy for the 21st century with the fastest economic growth in nearly four decades, along with the greatest year of job growth in American history. Of course, some of this is just the dynamic of coming out of COVID, coming out of the pandemic and the massive downturn in the year before. But AMH, can we get this back at the epicenter of the conversation for this administration? They're trying. You see that every day. Yesterday, the president met with executives to talk about Build Back Better. At the same time, what is overshadowing the questions the press are asking to the president and also just the time his administration is spending is these negotiations with Western leaders about what the sanctions package is going to be to President Vladimir Putin. As I continuously say, this just takes the oxygen out of the White House, and it is a pivot. The other thing we should note, Jonathan, is that Washington is going to be completely focused Focused on who the next Supreme Court justice is. But for the Democrats in this administration, that is certainly going to be a win because they're going to be able to appoint someone. And this is where the president could potentially cement a little bit of his legacy. Maria and Marie, thank you to both of you from Brussels and from DC. I keep coming back to that crude price. WTI, $88 a barrel. Brent right now, just short of 91. Had a little look at that a bit earlier, but there we are, 1968, up by eight tenths of 1% on both WTI and on Brent crude. Your equity market's doing okay, better than okay, at 1.7% with a sector price action. Here's Kriti Gupta. Well, good morning, John. You were just mentioning that oil price was seeping into the stock market, too. Energy is going to be your leading sector, followed by materials when it comes to a sector basis, but a fairly broad rally, which is to be expected when you have about three to four weeks of some pretty intense selling. I want to point your attention to the fact that information technology is all the way uh, towards the top of the leaderboard as well. What's important to keep in mind here is that a lot of this is coming from the semiconductor space in particular. If big tech's moves uh, are pretty strong, well, semis are even more massive. Magnified. Remember, in the last couple of weeks, semis actually kind of moved lower before the broader market did. And a lot of those losses kind of foreshadowed what was coming in the major index. One of the big things to keep in mind here is that it's also kind of coming back after hitting a 19 percent, uh, near, just near uh, the 20 percent bear market. It's now coming back after bouncing off of its 14-day RSI, essentially saying it's oversold, John. Pretty, thank you. Just distracted by the bond market right now. Got some curve flattening through this morning. A lot of that was led by the move at the front end. We had a push through 120. A lot of that now is led by the move at the long end. We come down six basis points on tens. This curve is getting really bunched up. Twos out to tens. If you look at sevens, and we have a seven-year auction a little bit later today, seven years versus tens, there's just a couple of basis points in it now. So we're getting really, really tight, getting much, much flatter. Twos out to tens now. The distance between the two. 64 basis points. That's one thing in a trading diary. I'll get to the rest of it going into the weekend. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Five minutes in, equities trimming the yearly loss, year-to-date loss on the S&P with positive by 1.6, taking a little bite out of the monster loss year-to-date so far for the Nasdaq with positive there, 1.5%. That doesn't get my attention. I know there's a lot going on in the equity market, but the thing that gets my attention right now is in the bond market. Twos, tens and thirties, and just the amount of compression we're getting, some real flatness through the curve, led now by the moving tens. We're down seven basis points there on thirties, we're down by eight. 
180, a break of that on tens, a break of 120 at the front end. A little bit early this morning, but we give some of that up now, up by only a basis point to 116.20 or so. That's the price action. Let's get to the trading diary. Your treasury auction, the seven-year note, 1 p.m. Eastern. Apple earnings after the closing bell. The employment cost index, that comes tomorrow. Look out for that. The ISM manufacturing numbers on Monday, an ADP report later in the week than the big one. It's payrolls Friday, just around the corner. From New York City, thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.